Hey, what's up, my people? John Middlecoff, new YouTube channel. What I need you to do, subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, share with your friends. Appreciate everyone that has. It's the podcast, three and out. You can listen wherever you listen to podcasts. Apple, Spotify, we got you covered. Also, thevolume.com, thevolume.com. We got merch right here, flex fit hat. Go to thevolume.com, get yourself a three and out hat. Well, 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 we have a couple playoff winners. Um, One we've come accustomed to, Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes destroy the Miami Dolphins. You know, probably, I think it's fair to say, easy to play Monday morning quarterback, the lock of the weekend. (laughs) The Dolphins were not going in to those temperatures with Tua Tungabailoa and winning a game, and they didn't. I would say it's a little shocking, especially the way the outcome came. D'Amico Ryan's. C.J. Stroud, Bobby Slowick, destroy, I mean, annihilate the Cleveland Browns. They were an underdog. I mean, the Cleveland Browns were favored, uh, and that was, they demolished them. No other way to say it. I mean, that was an old-school ass-kicking, so we'll get into the Chiefs. Uh, Some thoughts on the Dolphins. Something really stood out to me tonight watching that game uh, that's going to be a major offseason problem for them. Obviously, Houston, I, I you know, we need to celebrate them. And the Browns, listen, they lost. They, they had a fantastic season given the injuries, but they got a serious problem on their hands moving forward. And then a couple other things. The NFL had to move the Bills game to Monday. Uh, Antonio Pierce, Schefter reported, and Rap Sheet, and a bunch of people were reporting today, is the front runner for the Raiders job pretty clearly if they don't land Harbaugh. Uh, and Kalen Dubor was named the Alabama head coach. I watched some of his press conference today. From Sioux Falls to Roll Tide, what a move. We'll dive into it all, but first, game time. Download the number one ticketing app in America. My homies, the official ticketing app of this podcast. Go to your app store. Go to your iPad. Download the game time app. And when you download the game time app, here's what I need to do. Buy a pair of tickets. Do you want to go to a playoff game? Do you want to go to an NBA game, a college basketball game? Taylor Swift, you see her tonight? My guy Kyle Juszczyk, his wife, made her jacket. You want to go see a concert with your daughter? Go see Taylor Swift. Anything you want. Comedy shows, they got you covered. Download the Game Time app, and when you do, promo code John, $20 off. In these economic times, you ever go to the store? You ever go try to live life, the amount of money you're spending? What if I could save you 20 bucks? Buy a pair of tickets, do anything you want, $20 $20 off game time promo code John. Well, well, well. I th- sometimes in life we overcomplicate things. And listen, it's part of sports, uh, especially when it comes to football. You have, you know, six, seven days between games. You got a lot of time to think. And sometimes, you know, the old saying is paralysis by analysis. I, I think that can happen sometimes. And tonight, I I think most of us, if you're not a Dolphin fan, all came to the same conclusion. Yes, it was difficult for this Chiefs team to score this year. Yes, it does not look like the teams of yesteryear. Definitely of not of the early Mahomes-Andy run. But under no circumstances could I see, once the weather report came out, when I first got hired in the NFL in 2010, One of my jobs during the game week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and even Friday, they get out a little early, I would print out, I mean, this is a little old school, weather.com, the projected weather for Sunday or Monday or Thursday, depending on the day we were playing, and drop them off to obviously the coordinator and Coach Reed, but every coach, the projected weather. So obviously the weather, and we played in a cold weather city. I mean, the weather is a huge part of the sport of football, right? Let's use, you know, the NBA, for example. Zero impact, right? None. Even in baseball, for the most part, depending on where you are, it can impact you a little in October, depending on the team. But in football, it's freezing cold where I am. It's 50 degrees. I watched that tonight, eating dinner with my girlfriend, thinking, we talked about this. How much would I have to pay you? We we joked about, was it the Panther-Falcon game? Yeah, it was how much I would have to pay someone to attend that game. Remember, driving rainstorm, two of the most boring teams in the league, 
it, you know, everyone had their different number. Like, I don't know. Now, listen, I hate the cold. I don't know the amount of money you could pay me to attend that. But I do know the amount of money the Chiefs paid Patrick Mahomes. And they gave him $450 million. And with a guy like that, regardless how much quote-unquote is guaranteed, he's going to see every penny. And you saw tonight, he's worth every penny. Because I thought tonight, he looked pretty normal. Like, even some of the drops on some of the deeper balls, when the wide receivers clearly got a little confused by the wind, the ball landed at their fucking feet. I mean, the balls were right there. You watched him tonight and you went, that's a superstar. And you watched the other guy, which we'll get into in a little bit, and being like, you have no chance to win this game. But in that conference, right, you have to be able to play outside. Obviously, Patrick is the quarterback for a team that plays in frigid conditions. The AFC North, which is going to be good for a while, Steelers, the Ravens, the Bengals, and the Browns, all outdoor, all core. Cold. The Bills have a superstar quarterback, which the Chiefs are probably going to go to next year. Literally, the game just got delayed because of weather. Freezing cold. They ain't going away. If Gerard Mayo knows what he's doing and the Patriots can figure out a quarterback, that place is cold. Obviously, the Jets, if they ever win enough games to make it to the playoffs, I would never bet on that. Cold place. The AFC is a cold place to play. You have to be able to play outside in the elements. And Mahomes, like before him, Brady forever, has proven over and over and over again that he can't. Like tonight, scheme, none of it mattered. It was going to be ugly, even when it was 16 to 7 and a half. I had a buddy text me like, ah, they had to settle for some butt cur field goals. It's going to hurt them. No, it's not. This is not a game in the middle of October. This is middle of January. No one can feel any fucking part of their body. None of these field goals are going to hurt them. Miami, I would I would have bet $50,000 that Miami wasn't going to sniff 17 points at halftime. So no, being up 16 and 7. I'd argue the game was over at halftime. I, I felt really good. The Chiefs, if they just got like one more field goal, the Dolphins don't have a snowball's chance in hell to win this game. Because in these conditions, this isn't normal football. I, I, I interned for Kansas City before I went to work at Fresno State my senior year in college. And I ended up driving home back to Davis, California with my dad around, around Christmas time. He came to pick me up because the, you know, the, my, uh, I did like a quarter internship and right the day before we left, it was Sunday. We went, we went to like one of the last games of the season and I got field passes. My brother came out as well. I think he ended up flying back. And I remember taking them down to the sidelines. And in the corner of the end zone, and they mentioned this tonight on the broadcast, I know everyone hates listening to Jason Garrett. And listen, I'm not a huge fan either, but I refuse to bitch and moan about Peacock and Jason Garrett. It is what it is. They hired Drew Brees for this role. He was terrible. They fired him, and now we're here. Like, I'm not going to get up in arms about the NBC executives who are bad at their job. We have to watch Jason Garrett. It is what it is. For some reason, Mike Tirico can do a doubleheader. Collinsworth cannot. This is obviously contractual obligations. NBC is losing money by the day. Literally, they are. They're about to cut a bunch of staff in the NBC News. But that's a conversation. I'm not going to waste my time here. But I remember taking them down, and they were like, is the field frozen? And I forget the exact date. It might have been like December 20th, somewhere around there. It was so cold. And you you have the ability to function in that. Like, listen, the Chiefs have been built this season to play ugly. They can run the ball with Pacheco. Their defense is feisty. And never forget, they have one of the greatest quarterbacks we've ever seen. Oh, yeah, they also have one of the greatest head coaches we've ever seen. So tonight, watching them strangle Miami out in the first half in a cold, frigid game was the least shocking thing I think we're going to see all week. Honestly, if you told me the Packers beat the Cowboys, that is less shocking than what we witnessed tonight. If you told me the Steelers, like Warren, Najee Harris, run, run for a buck eighty and their defense creates some shit, and Josh is off, like, it'd be shocking, but not more than what we just, like, what we just witnessed was always going to happen. And listen, the Chiefs are going to be a tough out. Now, I don't think this changes that much from what we've seen. Like, they're playing an opponent that was obviously inferior. We've talked about Miami being a giant Fugazi. They've beaten no one except the Cowboys, and they definitely can't function outside. But, like, the Chiefs are used to playing in this game. If they can play Buffalo or they can play Baltimore 
and the game's ugly, they're going to have a chance. If you get into a, sh- uh, you know, a shootout, they're obviously going to be in some trouble if their defense isn't playing well. But th- this team, w- whenever you are playing all-time greats, and that's what Mahomes and that's what Andy are, uh, it's not going to be easy in a playoff scenario. Now, they're going to have to go on the road next week, you know, for the potentially. I guess, you know, if if Buffalo were to lose, they mentioned this, I, they could host the Houston Texans, which would be, I mean, I mean, talk about a gift. Uh, I have a hard time seeing that. Like, I expect them to go to Buffalo. And I think a lot of people, depending on how it looks with the Buffalo and the Steelers, are going to pick the Buffalo Bills. I, I probably will, too. But not, I, I will not look at the game like this. And I by no means will feel confident in picking the Bills. But th- this Chiefs team, man, it's called championship blood. When, when I lived in the Bay Area and the Giants were rattling off World Series, they weren't always the best team. They weren't always the hottest team entering the playoffs. But they knew how to win when it mattered the most. They knew how to win when their starting pitcher was off. Just like the Chiefs. They know how to win when it's fucking negative 10. They know how to win when, regardless who they're playing. Why? They've played them all at this point in time. So, fantastic win by the Chiefs. And I think the big picture question you have with you, the Miami Dolphins, you have one of the best defensive coordinators in the NFL and Vic Fangio. You had a million injuries. Listen, it, it can't get any worse than this. Mike McDaniel has proven to be an excellent offensive head coach. But you have a quarterback that if you have to play Mahomes at Arrowhead, Burrow in Cincinnati, Lamar in Baltimore, and Josh Allen in Buffalo, you're not going to win. He can't play in those conditions. And I was thinking watching tonight, how is anyone shocked? Born and raised in Hawaii. I I don't know about you. I've been to Hawaii 10 plus times in my life. It's beautiful. It's hot all the time. (laughs) Even when it rains, it's still warm. It's, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful places in the world. (laughs) It ain't cold. He went to Alabama, also not cold. And now he lives in Miami. So you're telling me a guy that has spent his entire life in warm weather conditions, who has an average arm, can't play well in inclement conditions, stunned, shocked. Here's the problem for the Dolphins, though. He's going into his fifth year. Like, all those guys got paid after their third. They didn't pay Tua yet. Now, Tua did well enough this year where it's like, how are you going to upgrade? You can't really. But when his reps call you this offseason and want 180, 170, 190 million dollars guaranteed, You'd have to think to yourself, how can our guy outplay those guys who are all paid a shitload of money and can all excel in cold weather? How can we ever go in those inclement conditions and win a game? Because more than likely, even if we have a good year, okay, one year we have the number one seed and we host the games. But clearly you're going to be three seed, the four seed, the five seed. You're going to have to go on the road and beat these teams in really cold weather. And you watch that guy tonight, and he did not have a chance. His one touchdown pass was an absolute prayer that Tyreek had to turn around, get pass interference on, catch it like Willie Mays, do a 360, go around another guy and score. That was their only touchdown. Like, listen, I'm not some Tua hater. He's a high-character guy. He's a solid player. He'd be awesome if he played for the Arizona Cardinals or even the 49ers or the Rams. When you play in the AFC, the road to the Super Bowl, and the road just to win a playoff game, more than likely is going to be frigid temperatures against Josh Allen, Mahomes, huge arms. Burrow, proven to play well outside. Lamar, who is infinitely more talented than Tua. How's he ever beaten those guys? So these conversations are going to happen. In literally the next month, I mean, we're not that far away from the Super Bowl being over and the Combine's right here and free agency's right around the corner. I'll promise you who wants to get paid. Tua and his representation. How can I pay you? Now, I could pay you, you know, $25, $30 million a year, but that's not what they're going to be asking for. You're talking about a guy that's going to be asking for $45, $50 million a year. The moment I pay you that, well, can you go toe-to-toe with the other $45, $50 million a year quarterbacks? I watched you tonight. Now, I know he's one of the greatest players of all time, he was in a different universe than you, like in a different world. So I, I how can I do that? No, I'm, I, it's not like I'm going to cut you or get rid of you because how do I upgrade? 
But they got a problem on their hands. Really good coaches. Some really good players. But their quarterback kind of puts them in no man's land. Because throughout the season, he's good. He's fine. Now, he gets outplayed in different spots against the best teams for the most part. But he well, does well enough in those games to like keep your head high. It really got exposed tonight. And when you play in the AFC, unlike the NFC, like think about the NFC. It's like where you got to go. Dallas, Dome, Detroit, Dome, Sa- San Jose, California, 60 degrees, no rain, sun. AFC is like Kansas City, frostbite. Buffalo, everyone dies of an avalanche. I mean, think about these. But Baltimore, frigid, rain, sleet. I mean, this is it's like two different worlds. So I, I think Miami man has. I'm not trying to shit on the guy. Like I'm not some hater. He's better than I thought he would be. Never been the biggest fan. He's better than I thought he would be. But I can't play with a weak arm quarterback in this conference. I, I can't do it. And you could argue even next year. Not buying into the Jets, but let's just say they improve a little. Rodgers comes back. Patriots just kind of get their shit together a little bit on offense. Obviously, the Bills are going nowhere. This might have been your best season to win the division. I mean, at one point in time, four or five weeks ago, the Bills building was on fire. Now they ended up winning it. It's like, I don't know, man. Uh, I'm not offering a solution here because I don't have one. They find themselves in the worst spot to be in the NFL. It's really easy when you're the Texans last year, need a quarterback. Panthers last year, need a quarterback, right? This year, Washington, New England, you need a quarterback. It, it's a no-brainer. It's hard to win your Miami, right? It, it's hard to do sometimes that that kind of crazy cutthroat move. I think you got to think long and hard about just all my options because I, I could not give to a hundreds of millions of dollars. Could not do it. And if you do do it, just be ready for what's coming. And it's not going to be pretty, Not not in that conference. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official betting partner of the NFL playoffs, is bringing you an offer to help make the playoffs electrifying. New customers can bet 5 bucks on any game and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook now and use code JOHN. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code J-O-H-N, JOHN. The crown is yours. Let's go to the first game. And I I think stand up, just give them a standing O. Because the Houston Texans, I was thinking about this between the games before we had to switch over to the the old Peacock. And the Houston Texans, who two years ago drafted Stingley with the third pick. Last year, they had the second and the third pick. Now, the second pick was theirs. And then obviously they traded up third pick. So back-to-back years, they drafted in the top three. They were a laughingstock. David Cully, Lovey Smith, just the, the whole Deshaun Watson and the masseuses. Just a fucking disaster. I mean, a complete embarrassment. No, no, no way around it. And now they win 10 games. They win their division. And they just curb stomp the Cleveland Browns, who I know they look bad today. They had an awesome season. I mean, they were really good. I mean, they beat the 49ers. They, they, they've beat... A ton of good teams throughout the season. And they've looked awesome down the stretch with Joe Flacco. And the Texans destroyed them. And I, I think it shows you. Listen, you know what they remind me of? It's a little different. But do you remember when the Colts got rid of Manning? Or, excuse me, Manning got hurt. They sucked. They cut him and they get luck. And they get a new coach and everything. And they're immediately good. And it was like, God, what's the upside for this franchise? Now, I don't, well, you know, CJ Stroud, Andrew Luck, both of them incredible rookie years, and you would buy all the stock. You know the differences in those situations, though? Chuck Pagano wasn't any good. D'Amico is. Ryan Grigson wasn't any good. Nick Casario is. You know, today when they beat the Cleveland Browns, that they own the Cleveland Browns first round draft pick this season? So when they beat them, they made their own pick better. Now, they don't own their pick because they traded to the Arizona Cardinals. But when you win a playoff game, who even cares? So to go to a position where you were one of the laughing stocks of the NFL, it looked like you had no future, you had no hope, you were going nowhere. To then a year later go, we might have, if not the greatest, 
I, I mean, listen, I, I think statistically, I, I know he's had one of the great rookie playoff performances of all time. Obviously, he had one of the great rookie seasons of all time. The NFL is a little easier to play in than maybe Marino in some of these years. He clearly is a fantastic player. So you get a guy that the Carolina Panthers regret not taking. There's no way. They can tell me whatever they want about the guy that's 5'9 and a buck 60. They would rather take C.J. Stroud. But you also have a star coach. Now, the one risky thing is their offensive coordinator, Bobby Slowick's interviewing everywhere. You lose him. That that would clearly hurt a little bit. But what a freaking season. What an incredible accomplishment by D'Amico, by C.J., by Nick Casario, by all their players. I mean, Nico Collins, how good is that guy? How good? I mean, th- that was part of what I respected a lot about the Cleveland Browns was like their physicality and their toughness. Not that they look soft today. They definitely look slow. They, they definitely look slow. I mean, the Texans look like a step faster than them all day long. I mean, early on in that game, you're like, is this thing going to really be like 40 to 37? And then it was like, no, that's the Browns are done scoring. And Joe Flacco is going to start throwing it to the other team. So this is a, listen, if the Texans, you know, go to Baltimore and lose by 20, tip your hat. Just an incredible season. An organization that has taken, next year they they potentially, we'll see, you know, the cap space is pretty fluid. Might have more cap space than every other team in the NFL. So you're telling me I got a star head coach, star quarterback, a ton of cap space, a ton of other good young offensive and defensive pieces. Now, and Bobby Slowick feels like he's a lock to get a job, but you never know. He he is pretty young. But you do this again. Like, honestly, even if you lose to Baltimore and you throw up 25 points, uh, he'll probably end up getting a job. But props to the Texans. And on the Browns. Like, I, I I'm not going to just act like this season didn't happen. What they accomplished this year with the amount of injuries they had was remarkable. Kevin Stefanski is a good coach. They lose tackles. They lose quarterbacks. They lose defensive pieces uh, constantly. They they go through random quarterback after random quarterback to ultimately settle on Joe Flacco, who was taking his kids to school and throwing footballs with his dad and his brother to stay loose. I mean, this is not normal. But I also, and I said this last week, and I'll reiterate it right now, like this is not a Disney movie. He he wasn't going to take this team to the Super Bowl. He was 38 years old. Historically, he's thrown a lot of picks. He hasn't even played good football in more than half a decade. This was actually pretty understandable that the guy just, I don't even want to say he melted down. He just played like he's been playing the last five or six years. Not good. And the biggest issue with the Browns, and I said this early in the season, is they had to make hay this season. Why? Because Deshaun Watson's cap number was $19 million. $19 million. Next year's cap number is $63 million. I'm not a math major, but you're talking about a $40 plus million swing in cap space. So you talk about the team that part of the reason they were so deep is they have a lot of good players in a lot of positions. Their team is never going to be this good ever again. The only way their team's going to be this good is if Deshaun Watson is $63 million cap hit, which I have to do the math after this podcast, might be the biggest in the NFL for a quarterback, is a top 10 quarterback. If he's not a top 10 quarterback, they're a disaster. Like if he just plays like the 17th best quarterback, kind of like he did at moments this year, they're fucked. Like part of the reason where he could just play okay and they could win some games, their roster was stacked. That's not going to be the case moving forward. They're going to have to get rid of some of these talented starters. So it's not Joe Flacco's fault. Joe Flacco just played like Joe Flacco, right? I mean, a couple pick sixes. Like, I've seen that before. It happened from Joe Flacco. And I know, and listen, it was a fun story. It was fun to watch. It was easy to root for. It was cool to watch and be like, yeah, I'm just playing loose, just having fun. Until you throw the ball to the other team twice in about five minutes and at least 14 points and the game's over. So I, I I don't know, man. The Browns have two good coaches, right? Stefanski's a good head coach slash offensive coordinator. And Jim Schwartz is a good defensive coordinator. But if I take away $43 million cap space, 
And now Deshaun Watson, who hasn't played that much the last three years, is coming back off an injury, and now all the pressure to not just function, but like play really well. Can you be the ninth best quarterback in the NFL and not the 18th best quarterback in the NFL or the 20th best quarterback in the NFL? Because if you're the 19th best quarterback in the NFL next year, we'll win seven games. That's a fact. And I, I think that was on full display today, that they, big picture, have a massive, massive question at quarterback. Okay, a couple other things I want to hit on. Obviously, the weather in Buffalo. They showed a clip during the broadcast tonight. Uh, you couldn't see, you couldn't function, and, and they moved the game back. I think big picture, the one question I have is Martin Luther King Day always was a day up until a couple years ago when the NFL added that Monday night game. Was And I guess and, and when they added an extra game, they, their playoffs fall on that weekend, was the NBA's day. And if you wake up, NBA is playing games like 9 a.m. all through the night, and they just have games going constantly. Well, that used to happen with Christmas, too. They own Christmas. Then the NFL came in and wiped them out, and no one watched Christmas Day NBA games. Now, I, I don't necessarily think there was some you know sinister, strategic move here. I, I legitimately think they wanted to play on Sunday morning. Snow was insane. Remember, this happened last year where the Bills had to fly to Detroit and play the game you know, in Detroit against the Lions. But I do wonder if this game goes well because it is a holiday. A lot of people are going to be home if they think about that big picture. Now, the problem with this is if the Bills win, they're playing the Chiefs, which would clearly be on Sunday. Just like if the Eagles were to win, you know, assuming, let's say, assume the Lions and the Cowboys win. Lions and Cowboys will play on Saturday. Niners-Eagles will play on Sunday. It's all based... The Monday teams, they're not going to put them on Saturday. You know they're going to play on Sunday. I do wonder if the NFL thinks about some stuff, though, if they do pretty big numbers on Monday, you know, afternoon. I guess it's 2.30 my time, Mountain West, right? Was it 4.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time? I I could see this be something that they, they talk long and hard about if their playoff are always going to fall on Martin Luther King weekend because that is an opening for them. And one thing we've seen when they have an opening, and I, I don't, they don't view the NBA as a competitor, but they do view the NBA as just people with eyeballs and they want to strangle them out. So if this goes well, it would not stun me if they do a 2 2 2 thing moving forward. At, at least it would be a discussion point at like the March owners' meetings. And listen, I, I got no issue with it. I'm cool with 2 2 2 2, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, another story this morning, Schefter, uh, I think reported that Antonio Pierce is now the leading front runner. If something big doesn't happen for Mark Davis, which is essentially saying, and I've been hearing this from some of my buddies who are assistant coaches. A lot of people think that Jim Harbaugh is going to end up with the chargers. Uh, so if Jim Harbaugh ends up with the chargers, Mark Davis is not hiring anyone else. Like I, he would be very, I think he is interested in Jim Harbaugh, but if he can't get him, one thing he's learned before, and he did this with the Rich, he's going to hire Antonio Pierce. His players like him. He likes him. Antonio Pierce takes a lot of pride in kind of the Raider thing. And I understand it. Like, I, I get it. Now, I also think it's a lot harder on a year-to-year -year basis when you get a guy with limited experience. When you get a guy season, and listen, I'm, I'm pro Antonio Pierce. Liked him. I had a lot of respect for him as a player. But... Their offense was a joke. And clearly, former linebacker, like, that's not his cup of tea. So how do they get a quarterback? And who's his offensive coordinator? And I would imagine when he's selling Mark Davis on him getting himself the job, he's talking about the ability to either land a guy in free agency or trade up in the draft. And clearly, he has an offensive coordinator that comes to mind that he's going to use because those are the biggest question marks. But in terms of leadership, like, he was team captain in the NFL. He was a guy that help take down and lead a defense that beat the shit out of the undefeated Tom Brady. Like leadership's not going to be his issue. Like that's a huge question with a lot of these offensive coordinators, Bobby Slowick, Ben Johnson, go around the NFL. Like, are they good leaders? Like, I know they can scheme, but can they lead? I know Antonio Pierce can lead. The guys are going to respect him. That's going to be the least of his worries. He, he can lead the entire team. Comes naturally to him. And, you know, coordination and especially offensive side of the ball to me is a question that, Honestly, he won't even be able to answer uh, until the season starts.
Now he, I guess he could make a sexy offensive coordinator higher, but you know, the free agency and, and the draft is going to be, they're going to have to get a good quarterback. Cause if they do not have a functional quarterback, they have no chance to compete for the playoffs. Not, not in this conference, but I totally understand it from a leadership standpoint. Uh, he, he just feels like a get it guy. Uh, my, my, like I said, my only question marks would be on the offensive side of the ball. And, as of right now, not that I have like inside information on Jim Harbaugh, it does kind of feel that Jim Harbaugh is going to go to the Chargers because I've been told that by a lot of people. Still seems a little crazy to me. I mean, that'd be cool. I'm not, I'm not anti that, but like he, him and the Spanos family, uh, be, be quite the marriage. But I'm here for it. <laughs> I, mean, I I watch all these AFC and NFC West games just because I live out here on the West Coast very closely. So sign me up. But. And that'd be another thing for Mark Davis, though. If you hire Antonio Pierce, you have a first-time head coach. Let's assume Jim Harbaugh goes to the Chargers against Jim Harbaugh, Andy Reid, and Sean Payton. It's not an easy easy job. That wouldn't be an easy job for a good coach. For, like, Shanahan or McVay, that'd be tough. So, buckle up, Raider Nation. And last but not least, I followed Kalen Dubor's career now pretty closely since he was at Fresno State, and I've said this over and over. That's why I bet on them against Sark. He is an elite coach. He is a badass. As an offensive schemer, as a leader, as a program runner, he's a stud. But one thing I've stood by for a long, long time is cultural fit matters in college football. In the NFL, it, it doesn't matter at all. Kyle Shanahan, where's he from? Andy Reid, where's he from? Right? Bill Belichick, none of it matters. Pete Carroll, like, I, it doesn't matter where you're from to coach an NFL team. In college, it matters. Most guys who have thrived on the West Coast in college, let's use Jeff Tedford, Pete Carroll, Jim Harbaugh, from the West Coast. Think about the South. Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, born and raised in West Virginia. Jimbo Fisher, won a natty at Florida State. Like, Southern guys thrive in the South. <clears throat> Urban Meyer is the one outlier who has gone to different places in the country in the last 20 years and thrived. I do think going to the South is a completely different animal. And when you're an outsider, which Kalen Dubor is, if things don't go right immediately, it can be a problem fast. Let's use Brian Kelly, for example. Brian Kelly is an awesome coach. If he goes 9-3 and three again at LSU, he might not last till year four. He went 9-3 and three this year with the Heisman Trophy winner. That will not be tolerated again. He could not go 9-3. and three. But look at the conference. Like It's not easy to get to 10-11 wins. So you replace a guy like Nick Saban. And I understand from Kalen Dubois' standpoint, you're coming from Washington. It's going to be hard to sustain success at that level. USC has more money than you. Oregon has more money than you. Obviously, Ohio State and Michigan have more money than you. It's it's challenging. You get this opportunity. You walk into a ready-made program, ready to compete for a national championship next year. But he's not a Southern guy. You, you replace Nick Saban. The standard, it couldn't be any higher. Even if you replace Belichick like Gerard Mayo, they've sucked for a couple of years. So if Gerard Mayo were to go 8-9 or 9-8 and eight next year, be like, oh, shit, we might have something with this guy. If Kalen Dubor goes 10-2 and two and does not play Georgia in the SEC championship game, it's a complete failure next year. That's the standard of taking over for Nick Saban. Right? So, now, ultimately, with the 12-team playoff, you get into the playoff, it's just challenging. So, I would if Kalen Dubor was a stock, I would bet on the individual. He's proven 104-12. and 12. All he does is win. I do think it can be difficult to go into the South, though. I saw it with Jim McElwain. He went to Florida... They were having success going to the SEC championship game. He got run out of town. Now, he didn't win as many games as, like, he, he wasn't consistently winning 10 games. But still, he was not some loser. And there's a pressure there. It's treated like the NFL. The money is no issue to get rid of guys. I mean, we've seen Jimbo Fisher and Ed Ogeron. These guys are paid countless millions to pack up their stuff and leave. So I'm rooting for them. I, I, I do not think this is easy, though, as some of the people are making it out to be. I think there's an intensity to it. You know, he's not a great recruiter. That's another thing. Like, Google Washington, where they rank in the Big Ten recruiting rankings. Not super high. 
Like, say what you want about Nick Saban. He took recruiting very seriously. I think last year he had one of the best recruiting classes in Alabama history. This year they literally finished second. Like, he was, Nick Saban was an elite coach, an elite recruiter. I think Kalen DeBoer has a chance to be an elite coach. Is he an average recruiter? Like, Kirby Smart, elite recruiter. Urban Meyer, elite recruiter. Jim Harbaugh, very high effort, big-time recruiter. It takes a lot of effort. And I, I think the pressure on this one, I'm a little leery. I'll say that. Now, I don't think he could ever fail in terms of, like, ruin the program. I just think the expectations, the amount of first-round picks they expect you to have, the amount of games they expect you to win, the intensity behind it, it it's very, very difficult. And honestly, it might be a job that no one could have filled. Why? Because no one can fill Michael Jordan's shoes. Like when Tiger Woods left the PGA Tour, there's nobody else. You get rid of Nick Saban, even if I bring in a guy that knows what he's doing, it's not the same. And when it's not the same and you have a fan base, people get pissed off. So I I do think it's going to be, I do think it's going to be hard. Though I think this season, given how much talent's on the roster, I think Alabama's going to be pretty good.